As PC gamers, obviously most of our attention when it comes to graphics is in reference to NVIDIA, AMD, and to a certain extent, Intel. The first two mentioned are the only companies left who produce GPUs for dedicated graphics cards, though it's possible S3 GPUs are still being made for the Chinese market, which is a lot less transparent to us Westerners. While the PC space is dominated by the big three, the mobile market is populated by quite a number of small yet storied graphics processor developers that license their GPUs for integration on SoCs paired with ARM CPU cores. One of the most important is PowerVR, who dates back to the early days of PC 3D accelerators, even providing the graphics coprocessor for the Sega Dreamcast. Early on, Powered VR differentiated itself by emphasizing the use of tile-based rendering that still serves as the basis for their rendering pipeline. In 2001, after losing market share to NVIDIA and ATI, Power VR left the PC graphics space and since then re-emerged as the leading developer of mobile graphics. Their biggest success is being Apple's exclusive provider of graphics for iPhone and iPad SoCs, and they've even seen some use in some generations of Intel Atom products. During recent years, PowerVR, like NVIDIA and AMD, developed less monolithic GPU architectures that could scale performance excellently with increased number of shader cores, or in PowerVR's case, clusters. Some recent designs like the 12-cluster GT7800 and the iPad Pro's A9X SoC can sustain well over 300 GFLOPs of compute. This directly approaches mainstream levels of Intel's own IGPs. Most phones are still sitting well below this, but the advances in mobile SoCs helps both the phone and tablet markets thanks to a similar need for power efficiency, lower heat generation, and continuous desire for more graphics performance as pixel densities continue to increase. In a blending with the PC market, mobile API standard OpenGL is the de facto graphics API, and for the few that use Windows phones, they use DirectX. Now getting into the nitty gritty, as an industry leader in mobile graphics, PowerVR continues to innovate with their new Furion graphics architecture, their first real change in architecture after seven years. As always, power efficiency is as important as capability. Compared to the current rogue architecture used for the few previous generations, making this happen comes from changing the number of pipelines per cluster from 16 to 32, simplifying the amount of control logic necessary for the amount of shaders. Just as importantly, one of the dual multiply add divide ALUs found on rogue pipelines is replaced with a mole ALU which further simplifies the pipeline, reduces power usage, and requires less access to the register. The net effect PowerVR claims is that Furion achieves 35% more GFLOPs and 80% more fill rate within the same area of silicon at the same clock speeds. PowerVR states that making proper use of the secondary MAD unit was always difficult. Replacing it with a MOL unit made more sense, even if it is less capable, as it still serves some functions. This does bring to mind AMD's use of VLIW4 in a few of their final pre-GCN products over VLIW5, like the Radeon 6950 and the Richland APU. In many cases, software wasn't making proper use of the VLIW5 SIMD, and it made more sense to simplify the pipeline, which in turn reduced the number of transistors, meaning a smaller die and less power consumed for effectively similar real-time results. Texture units on Furion will be capable of 8 bilinear texture samples per clock versus 4 on Rogue to keep it in line with the increased capability per cluster. Regardless of some of Furion's simplifications, it will support newer versions of Vulkan, OpenCL, OpenGL, and probably DirectX 12 if Microsoft continues to willingly bleed itself in the phone market. Furion itself is not fully HSA compliant, but does embody many HSA capabilities, perhaps not all that different from some of AMD's earlier APUs. And interestingly enough, PowerVR has built some customization capabilities into Furion for function-specific pipelines, including, apparently, ray tracing or whatever a customer sees fit. PowerVR describes that the plumbing, if you will, is already waiting for any necessary enhancements. PowerVR further describes Furion as applicable to deep learning as well as compute beyond graphics, especially when we consider Furion's ability to have custom graphics IP added directly to the GPU. The number of clusters Furion can scale to is currently unclear, but in a 32 cluster system at 1 GHz, we'd have two teraflops of single precision compute without considering any custom GPU enhancements. It's highly unlikely PowerVR will fully develop such a large-scale Furion derivative, 
A much more practical configuration for something like a smartphone would be four clusters delivering 250 G-flops at 500 megahertz at the very max. I have no doubt that Furion will be a success and I certainly expect every foreseeable Apple product to use it once the current power of VR Rogue series has been retired. However, to limit it to ARM SOCs using the typical products that come to mind almost seems like a waste. Just like PC gamers, there is an insatiable appetite for graphics performance in phones, but of course power efficiency and TDPs keep it extremely restrained. From a technical perspective, mobile graphics are in many ways just as impressive as those that draw power from a wall. And just like desktop graphics, PowerVR wants to target 4K, 120Hz displays, as well as VR. From a business perspective, what is interesting is that PowerVR plans to sell Furion along with Rogue at the same time until Furion completely replaces Rogue outright. PowerVR's hopes and dreams for Furion almost remind me of AMD GCN, with almost the same kind of fervor towards delivering a powerful, yet flexible architecture for the compute work of today and tomorrow. And if it wasn't for the constraints of mobile holding them back, many of these mobile graphics solutions like Furion are quite capable and scalable to current console and lower end PC gaming levels with the right cooling, power delivery, and memory bandwidth. I almost wish PowerVR would re-enter the PC gaming arena just to shake things up with the dedicated graphics duopoly of AMD and Nvidia. However, it would be next to impossible for PowerVR to do this without an immense amount of capital as well as manufacturing partners and tuning their manufacturing processes towards higher clock speeds. As long as Apple makes use of them, they'll remain a force in the graphics industry even if people don't realize they exist. While having the fastest mobile devices doesn't really concern me, a better understanding of mobile graphics architecture does. It makes for some great comparisons against the latest from AMD, Intel, and Nvidia. So thank you guys for watching, I hope that you found this interesting, go out there and find out more about the mobile graphics architectures that all exist. There are a lot. There's PowerVR, there's Vivante, there's Qualcomm, there's ARM's Mali GPU architecture. And how can I forget NVIDIA Tegra? And there's also numerous other smaller companies like DMP, who developed the GPU for the Nintendo 3DS. There's a lot. So yeah, go out and find out, have fun. There's plenty to know, plenty to research. Until then guys, stay civil, stay respectful, stay curious. My name is Blitzfogel. Hasta luego.